I'm going to ask you to stand and open up your Bibles this morning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. And we're looking at a series that we're calling Futures. And we're looking at the many prophetic doctrines of the Bible and how they relate to our time and, of course, God's nature. We're looking today at a message titled, After the Saints Go Marching In. Last week, we talked about the rapture of the church, and now we're going to go and begin now our study of what happens to this world after the church is removed from the earth. And so, after the saints go marching in, that is, into heaven, what happens in this world? And we're going to be reading a remarkable portion of scripture today where Paul the Apostle gives the Thessalonian believers this amazing overview. And uh, by the way, he's going to cover in few verses uh, what is at least a seven-year period of time. I'm going to read the odd-numbered verses. If you'll join together reading the even-numbered verses of 2 Thessalonians 2. If you don't have the King James, the new King James Version, then you can look to the screens and join us there. Verse 1, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Wow, what a verse. Verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And for this reason, that's verse 10, that's the reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Wow. Father, we, uh, your, your Bible tells us, your scripture tells us that uh, you love the one who trembles at your word. And this is one of those examples that should cause all of us to tremble. The one that needs to tremble the most is the one that has no clue nor care about what your Bible tells us and even speaks of them here. Those that would reject your love, your gospel, your forgiveness, your lordship over their lives. And as we look at the prophetic word of God, we see right here where there's coming a time when those who have played too long with the things of God without a serious commitment, will someday be swept away with overwhelming deception sent by you upon them in judgment. So Father God, we pray that for all of us that are here now and those that are watching and listening, that that would not come near to us, that we would be careful students and obedient children of your word of life, We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated, church. As we mentioned last time together, the number one priority and purpose of all of the doctrines of the Bible is to bring you and I to a full understanding of God's salvation that is purchased by his grace, that is God's gift has been given to us. 
and his act of redemption, which Jesus Christ not only died on the cross for the sins of the world, yes, that's true. The Bible says Jesus paid the debt of all sin. But that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that everybody goes to heaven. He paid the price, but only those who accept his gift of salvation go to heaven. And in that great display of love, there is damnation of those who reject. And it's not that he, in his attitude or in his character, damns them or condemns them. The Bible says that we, as a human race, is condemned already. But he gives the offer for us to come and receive the forgiveness of our sins and the hope and the assurance of eternal life. That's the gift of salvation. Imagine in this Christmas season, for example, you give someone a gift and they just throw it right back in your face and they say, not only do I not want your gift, get out of my house. You would walk away sad and rejected and disappointed and hurt. And yet every day all around the world, the gospel goes out and there are people who say, I don't need, to, I don't need that. You, God, you get out of here with that. And there's a judgment here. And according to the context of our study, we're looking at the world that transpires after the saints go marching into heaven when they're called up. The power of God's word. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 5, 13, an awesome passage of scripture. John, the, the author of uh, John's gospel, the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John was the one given the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation. In 1 John 5, 13, the Bible says these things, it's John speaking, have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, isn't that awesome, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Salvation is the key Bible doctrine and the key to Bible prophecy doctrine. Salvation. Salvation. Your salvation is paramount. The issue of your life. The fact is Jesus Christ in his first coming that we are as a world about to celebrate called Christmas time was a matter of Bible prophecy being fulfilled. The same fact is true that Jesus Christ's second coming when he returns is a matter of Bible fact. I love that. We ought to be very bold and very encouraged, lest we be found out to be hypocrites. Christmas is coming as a day that we've appointed to celebrate. That day, 2,000 years ago, was a Bible prophesied day. When we talk about the second coming of Christ and end time events and the rapture of the church, it is a prophesied prophetic event. And we can be rest assured that God's going to fulfill his word. But the study of the Bible and Bible prophecy, you guys all know, right? Unless you're visiting today, that um, because there's been so many new people coming to church, this series is very intentional. I'm telling you that it's absolutely intentional as I've been announcing because so many people have come from so many churches that have never studied the prophetic doctrines of the Bible. And yet over a quarter percent of your Bible is futuristic in its messaging. And that's remarkable. That's powerful. And you need to know that. And I have to be, be very honest with you. I expect people to write me letters and say things like, I'll be back after you're done with this series. I don't want to hear this kind of stuff. And that's dangerous, but that's exactly why I'm doing this. You need to know the full counsel of God, even if it results in this sanctuary being emptied out. You need to know the truth. And we're living in amazing days. I don't want you to miss out on anything. These are amazing times to know God's word. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13 says, and then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Isn't that a great promise? Verse 12, verse 13 goes on, and you will seek me and find me when you have searched for me with all of your heart. What a great promise. It is incumbent upon God's people to seek him and to call out to him and to pray. That's who we are. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 
answers that in the New Testament. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is, there's the word, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You want to know what God's will is for your life? It's no mystery. It's found right there in Hebrews eleven six. Seek God with all of your heart, be diligent, and God will reward you for your pursuit. And so that's why we want to be devoted to the full counsel of God. By way of introduction, six things I want you to write down really quick. This is vitally important. Why do we need to study these things? Number one, because if you do, you will grow more resilient in this world regarding temptation. Watch this. Listen to this. Write it down. If you seek all of God's word, the Bible in totality, including prophetic or Bible teaching chapters and books, like the book of Revelation, like the book of Daniel, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that you have a growing supernatural resilience against the temptations of this world. It's a supernatural reality. Just like putting food into your stomach causes you to have energy or gas in the tank of your car. The same thing is true about understanding that God's word is true. You can bank on it. God will keep his word and that will make you resilient. I use the word resilient, but you know, I love the word galvanize. It will galvanize you against the temptations of this world. Number two, you will have an increased activity or action or strength to endure all the issues of life when you see what's going on. California, our government, uh, our weather is fine. Now, this a little too cold for me, personally. <laughs> First service, I didn't know if we'd survive, but we made it. <laughs> but just this last week, I don't know where you live, but the winds start blowing, and you can set your watch to it. Some bozo starts a fire to destroy people and our property, and it stinks, and it's smoky, and it's terrible. And I found myself this last week looking out the window of my house to, yet again, billowing smoke, and I concluded this, Lord, I'm so glad we're in this series, because you're reminding me right now, this this world is not my home. And, uh, you know, read the fine print of the Bible, by the way. It's so biblical to understand that. Uh, The the Bible says that we're not going to get flooded again when God judges the earth. It's all going to (laughs) burn. So you just remember that. Next time you see the hills on fire, call 911 and then be reminded, (laughs) it's all going to (laughs) burn. Did you buy a new car? It's going to burn. A a new dress? Did you buy a new house? It's all going to burn. Eventually... You know what? Knowing that he's coming back and that he keeps his word is going to give you the ability to endure. Thirdly, uh, you will notice that, and this is important, that the more you are fixated on Christ's return and that effect upon your life, you're going to find yourself thoughts and habits of sin growing less and less powerful in your life. They're going to diminish and lose strength. We all need to hear that. That the more you focus on Christ's return, the habit of sin and the thought of sin will be greatly, greatly diminished in your life. Somebody say amen to that. That's a great thing. That's called, by the way, holiness. That's God doing it in you. It's not you doing it yourself. And then another thing, number four, is that you will find yourself thinking and speaking and doing more from a heavenly heavenly perspective. You're going to get excited about doing things that bless the heart of God. A people that are eating, consuming, and doing the word of God is a people experiencing revival. You need to know that. Number five, you will delight. You will delight in the desire to serve and love others. It's just going to happen. Ministry opportunities. When the Bible gets in you, you know what comes out of you? Words like this. Hey, how can I serve? What can I do? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that come out of your own life? You know why that's happening? Because the Bible's stirring you up. You've eaten it, and now it's gotten a hold of you, and it's been converted into spiritual energy, and you're not content anymore to sit around and be a a pew potato. It's like, I got to do something. 
Here's the cool thing about that. You don't have to do anything. But when God gets a hold of you, you get all excited. And you say, well, how am I going to know? You're going to be excited about it. You're going to pull up to church here and you're going to say, we need to do something about the parking. <laughs> Maybe God gave you the idea to fix it. Because the Lord knows we need help. <laughs> Maybe you've got the idea. You get excited about it. Whatever it might be. That's God doing that in you. Why? Because you're fixated on his word. And his word is telling you that he's coming back. So let's get up and let's get going. And then sixth, you'll develop a very high view of scripture. This Bible, this book will come alive to you. It's no longer a one hour Sunday gig, but it's a daily thing with God. This book will come alive and it will be very, very highly respected and valued. I grew up at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. I, I've never known any other church than that. Pastor Chuck was my pastor. And by the way, today's 55 year anniversary, right? 55 year anniversary of Chuck Smith starting Calvary Chapel today, which is a pretty awesome thing. But, um, but just growing up at that ministry, every day of the week, there were incredible ministries taking place. And way back in the 70s on Wednesday nights, uh, the, the chief executive officer of a corporation called Western Digital would pull up in his Ferrari in the church parking lot. He'd grab his briefcase and run because he was always late. He would run to the podium and he would open up his Bible and start giving an insane Bible study. Every word, every, I mean, it, I'm talking about Chuck Missler. The guy just unlocked the Bible and I got an appreciation of every word of the Bible meant something. And what did that result in? High view of scripture. And that's what God would have you to do. Remember that. You're going to grow. You're going to have this endurance. You're going to notice that sin's diminishing. You're going to find a heavenly perspective operational in your life. You're going to be delighting and loving other people. And you're going to de develop a high view of scripture, which leads us to this. Now, after the saints go marching in to heaven, if you missed last Sunday's message, get it. We now look at argument number one, a post-rapture world. There is left behind a world in free fall. Will you mark that down? When the rapture takes place, the world will go into what I'll just call a free fall. Designed, by the way, by God, and let's be honest, designed by the principalities and powers of darkness. This is the hour of darkness when this happens. And number one, church, there is what's left behind in a post-rapture world what we see in verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 2, look at verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means. Ain't no way. Don't let anyone bamboozle you into anything else other than Bible that the day will not come unless or until the falling away comes first and, here it is, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Mark in your notes, we're talking about the Antichrist. There is no way, according to Scripture, that the Antichrist can be revealed to the world in power until the church is taken out of the way. And then he's going to be revealed. There'll be this massive void created when the rapture takes place in the spiritual realm. I want to, I want to underscore that. I don't want to disappoint you, and I really want to be wrong about this. But when the rapture happens, I don't think there's going to be a hundred zillion, trillion, million people missing all over the planet and people are freaking out. I don't believe that's going to happen. I think that's a smaller number than what books or articles would like you to believe. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be such, such a big, noticeable thing. I just don't think so. When I look around the world and I think scripture agrees, Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? And in the day and age in which you and I live in, there certainly is a falling away. People departing from faith. And when Christ comes back, though, there will be what's most important, a void, as it were, where spiritual light is removed in a degree and darkness will fill that void. But there'll be a post-rapture world and it will be in a, a free fall. And how so? Well, we know this, that the man of sin is going to be revealed. The man of sin, the Bible calls him the Antichrist. Uh, he's also, by the way, 
Judas Iscariot was called the son of perdition in the Bible, and only one other person is called the son of perdition, and that is the Antichrist. The Antichrist, the word Antichrist, it doesn't mean he runs around, you know, with red underwear and a pitchfork. That's not who he is. He, Antichrist means instead of Christ or the replacement for Christ. An imposter. He's going to be an imposter. This is Satan's plan, according to the Bible. And he's going to have a realm of deception. But in a post-rapture world, in the darkness, this void will be filled. Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. Wow. Translation, the Holocaust will look like a picnic. No, nor ever shall be. A time so gross, so dark, so terrible after the church is out of here. Deception will become the norm. I know that will never happen in our day and age where deception will be the norm. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Deception, trickery, to deceive. My, my, how things have changed in one week. The magnitude of deception now. Witnesses having come forth, sworn affidavits, people now whistleblowers on the grand deception. Some people are saying that if this turns out the way that it's looking with all of these people who are under oath, that if they're lying, they're going to go to prison. If it's all true, then we're looking at what might be the most prolific deception in the history of man thus far. Think of it. Voting fraud, all of these things, people paid with, with evidence of international schemes. And there's even been some shootouts in other countries over material and evidence. And all these things are coming together and states are starting to wake up and, and uh, things are starting to be looked at and rescinded. Well, we're, we're, we're going to be taking this back and all the, what's going on? Forget about the politics of it. It's deception. People were deceived and they went about to deceive. How does that happen? When somebody lies to you, how is it that they lied to you? Well, they lied to you because they're liars. And they learn how to lie. It's not hard to learn how to lie, by the way. We naturally... Our little kids, you never say, listen, listen, this is how you, this is how you tell a lie, Susie. Listen to me. No, you got to tell them to tell the truth. They're cute as a button, but the little creeps, they'll lie. They will lie right in front of you. They'd rob you if they could, and if they had the motor skills, they'd shoot you. You ever see how angry they get when you tell your two-year-old, you can't have that. They just got my dad. Man, if they had a gun, it'd be over. It's in them already. It's inside of them. And listen, in a post-rapture world, there'll be a world in free fall and evil will be rampant. Look around right now and listen to what's forthcoming. A world of violence. 2 Thessalonians 2, look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one. Are we experiencing lawlessness? Yes, we are. And this hasn't even happened yet. This is just warm-up. You say, Pastor, I wanted my friend to come today to be encouraged. <laughs> listen, you want to be encouraged? Want to be encouraged? Listen carefully. Listen carefully, because you don't have to go through all this stuff. I told you, this is a post-rapture teaching now of what's going to happen after the Christians are gone. Should Christ come back? And look, let's be honest. If he doesn't come back soon, it's not, a, it's not it won't even be a surprise. If he doesn't come back soon, it's, it's not going to be a surprise. It's like, what else could happen? <laughs> When's he going to surprise us? We look around at the world, it's like, any day now. In fact, Lord, I think, I think five minutes ago would have been really good. <laughs> the world's gone nuts. But that's because you know his word and you can identify. So the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all, church, remember this, all means all when you see the word all in the Bible. It doesn't mean some power. All power, 
signs, and lying wonders. You and I have no power against that warning, but by the Holy Spirit dwelling in your life as a believer. 1 John tells us that it's the Holy Spirit in you that is protecting you against false teachings. Did you know that? You'll never be deceived if you know your Bible. But notice it's all of this, all power, all signs, all line wonders. The devil is coming to manifest in this world by this man called the son of perdition, or we call him the Antichrist. Remarkable. Verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. This will put the hair on your neck up. Listen to this. This should terrify us. And with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. The Greek language means that they are already on the road to destruction, to hell. They're on the road. They're in the bus together. But don't, 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 don't get too judgmental. According to the Bible, we were all in that bus at one time. Some of us got out of the bus. Can you imagine? Big bus pulls up. Satan opens the door. He looks really cool. He doesn't look like this. He looks great. Hey, come on in. Uh, why? What do you, what, whatever you want to do. If you want to do it, do it. You got to do it in the bus. Whatever you want to think, think it. But you got to get on the bus. And people get on the bus. Humanity got on the bus. And the Bible says all of us are condemned. All of us are lost. Every single one of us. The only difference is from those that are in heaven and that are in hell is the blood of Jesus. <laughs> is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Look to him, the Bible says, and be ye saved, all you ends of the earth. Look to him. You can't get prettied up and cleaned up, and you can't go get your own bus. Listen, mankind is careening over the cliff in sin, and Christ gives us his ex extended arms and says, believe in me and I'll take you out. Come to me. He sends the gospel. It's a terrifying verse, though. Look what it goes on to say. They're perishing, but look, because they did not. Here's the reason why. It's because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. This is a terrifying verse, people. I'm going to give it to you quickly because it's not the point to our study today. But this should honestly cause you to stay awake tonight with, with care and concern. They knew the way, they knew the gospel. They heard it, but they decided, they concluded, oh, I don't want to be saved. It says that they, look, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. The word is paralabao. It means para, like a parachute. Parachute's over your head. Notice, the parachute is not wrapped around your body, is it? You hope not. It's over your head. Lambano is to take in. It means to receive someone as though you're pulling them into you. Paralambaos do the opposite. It's to have someone right in front of you and you push them back. You just push them back. The world is divided into two groups. There are those that are embracing Christ and as it were, your very person Day by day is getting molded and shaped and you become one with him versus the other person who hears the truth and rejects it by holding it off. Pharaoh held off the truth until he couldn't get out of it, out of his condemnation. He held it off and he stood in his falsehood until he was condemned. Think of it. Isn't that what Judas did in the garden? I believe theologically when Judas came in the garden to Turn Christ over to the guards. Isn't it amazing? Jesus went up, Judas went up to kiss him. Remember? Because this prophet said that he would be betrayed by a kiss. But what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, you wretch, I've been so good to you. You even did miracles when I sent you and the rest of the guys out on your first mission journey throughout Judea. You saw the power of God. 
You and your, you and your, the, the 11, you guys preach the gospel, cast out demons and raise the dead. And this is the thanks I get? You remember Jesus sent out the 12 and they all did those miracles, including Judas. No, Jesus says, is it with a kiss that you betray the son of man? Why did Jesus say that to him? I believe Jesus was giving him one more chance to say, you know what, I'm calling this thing off. I repent. Why did Jesus quote that scripture from the Old Testament? Bringing it to Judas' attention. A post-rapture world wrapped in darkness. That verse goes on, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11 says, For this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Isn't that amazing? Everybody wake up to this. This is... This is terrifying. God will send, when the rapture takes place, there'll be those who knew the gospel, but yet toyed and played with it. Maybe you're here today and you're toying and playing with it. You say things like this, yeah, yeah, I'll believe you guys after you're out of here. Then I'll wake up, yeah, then I'll know it's true. No, you won't. No, you will not. The Bible says God will send you strong delusion so that you will believe, definite article, the lie There is a lie coming from the halls of hell that will be spoken either by false prophets, false teachers, or by the Antichrist himself, and the world's going to believe it because it's the beginning of God's judgment upon a Christ-rejecting age. Think of it. The rapture, and how's that going to happen, by the way, when people are gone, when people are taken away? I have my opinion. Warning, this is my opinion. And it's not, it's not totally uneducated. The New Age movement for years have explained that there's going to be the next wave of evolution, and it will not be over millions of years. It will be over nanoseconds. They believe that the next evolutionary move is when man hyper moves or hyper evolves into a state of deity. This is the epitome of the New Age movement. And they preach that. So what does this mean? They have said in their writings, uh, David Spangler or Springer is one of the guys who, by the way, he had a famous student who believes this and preaches it, or at least did. I don't know what became of her. Some woman by the name of... Uh, Who's the lady down in Malibu? She was famous. Uh, the Betty. Yes, Shirley MacLaine. Thank you. Shirley MacLaine. She preaches that. That what's going to happen is that the Christian who is resistant to the next wave of evolution will be removed from the earth by a great power. A great power. And some have said that It's going to be UFOs. It's going to be aliens. It's going to be, which I believe are, that's demonic. I believe it's demonic activity. Oh, did you see that? What was that thing? Oh, I had a dream and I was, (laughs) demonic. (laughs) It's demonic. Could that explain it? Oh, wow, we saw this stuff in the sky. Didn't Jesus warn there's going to be signs in the heavens that would deceive people? What if something happens in a post-rapture world? And that's, that's, that's the lie. You say, well, that's ridiculous. You're correct, but that's, listen, God says, I will send them strong delusion that they will believe the lie. Could it be that that lie is, this is why your son is gone or your husband's gone? Something's going to happen. And then listen, secondly, there is left behind a cry for peace and safety. I find this remarkable, church, Peace and safety. The world always wants peace and safety. I get it. Don't you want peace and safety? Satan, are you guys here? Okay, you can be a little Pentecostal. You can say like... Anyway, so peace and safety, that's something that's us. It's our... Well, it's normal, and it's good. God wants you to live in peace and safety, but you and I live in a a dangerous world, and and, when things get dicey, you want peace and safety. But the Bible tells us about a time that's coming where all love for one another is going to be removed from this world and there's going to be lawlessness, there's going to be wars, there's going to be mayhem, and there's going to be violence on the earth. And the Bible warns us over and over again, a cry for peace and safety. It's what man has always cried for. It's what's behind the whole concept of a utopia. Man doesn't do well when he's left on his own. 
And for whatever reasons, even some people today might be talking about a socialist world, tr just trying to bring the world together. Do you remember? We'll, I'll read it next week. because It's in my notes, but I know we'll never make it. Do you remember John Lennon's 1971 hit, Imagine? You ought to take the time to read it. It's a globalist prayer about all of us being together as one, and we've got to do this because there'll be no more war. I understand that desire, but listen, there's only one way to end war, and that's to pray for the Prince of Peace to return. And the Antichrist is going to come onto the world scene as an imposter. There's going to be a global cry for, in a post-rapture world, the world is going to cry out for peace and safety. Listen to this. You sitting down, you ought to write this. This is amazing. This doctrine is introduced to us in Daniel chapter 8, the ancient book of Daniel. Verse 25, it says, regarding the son of perdition, the Antichrist, it says, and through his policy, listen, the word policy is by his answers. Policy is answers in the Hebrew. By his answers. So church, you know why this is important? It's because people have a lot of questions. The world is going to be asking questions. He's going to have the answers. He shall cause craft to prosper. Stop right there. The word craft is the word seductive or seducing deceptions, plural. Seducing deceptions. I want you to just think about that for a moment. That's no stranger to us. Seducing deceptions. Whenever you get pulled away or taken off course from your Christian life, or maybe you're not a Christian, regardless, Satan, listen, the Bible says God loves you. That means Satan hates you. And he's out to destroy you because God loves you. And so he brings to you seducing deceptions. What does that look like? Well, you know, Friday night, Lisa and I had a blast because we were the oldest ones in the room. We met with the young married couples. First time, as the launch of the ministry, Lisa and I uh, sat with them, talked with them. We had so much fun. Um, but, you know, they're young. And some of them, we had, we had a couple in there been married for four weeks. And I think the oldest or the longest married couple, I think, was 11 years in there. So we've been married 40, oh, coming up on 42 years, I think. 42, I should know this. I hope she's not here. <laughs> and so we're up there answering questions and stuff. And we talked about, we talked about the relationship that you and I have as humans. I'm talking about our humanness that, you know, when you meet someone and there's incredible explosive fireworks and, and wonder and they're amazing, they're perfect. I've never met anybody like that before. Guess what we already know about you. You must be, you must be 22 months or less into this relationship. Because listen, scientists tell us that that euphoric that we call infatuation lasts between 18 and 22 months, where the, the guy burps, and she just goes, oh, that is so amazing. And, you know, her breath, her breath stinks, and he just, oh. What is it, what is it? You have puppy breath. It's like, are you kidding me? It's sickening. It's sickening to see it. But it has to happen. It has to happen because, listen, that's part, that's part of our experience. There's a reason for it. It sets a part of us in the relationship. It's not bad. It's good. But it's got to weather that. It's got to go beyond that. And we're telling them. We're te I'm telling you everything we told them. And, but then you've got to go past that to where he no when he sweats, he stinks. <laughs> and her breath, he says, you need to do something about that. That's love. That's love. Listen, it's a decision you make. It's out of the feeling and into the work of love. It's what it is. Listen, God didn't invent marriage to make you happy. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> Seriously, that's from a Hallmark card. God invented marriage to make you holy. It's all about you serving the other person. And if you get a little queasy about getting married, if you can't serve people, st stay, just go take a walk. <laughs> But listen, it's all, when you love somebody, you serve them. And how in the world did I get on that topic from this message? 
Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Oh, this is why, seducing deceptions. When, when you get into it, I got it, I got it. When, when you get, when you get into the, when you get into the long haul now of, of, the, of the marriage, if you don't maintain it, a, a seducing deception will come along. And her name might be Bubbles, and she'll meet you at the, she'll meet you at the drinking fountain at the office. It's called an affair. Oh, I've never, I haven't felt like this before. Deception. Or hey, I know this sounds too good to be true, but if we invest one dollar, we'll make a million. Deception. Satan knows this about us. And Daniel says, there's one coming onto the world scene. He's going to have all the answers and you'll be able to identify his practices. He's going to seduce the world because he's going to cause craft to prosper. He's going to cause people to get what they want. But he goes on. He shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace, that's a seductive calm, he will destroy many. Peace and safety. Peace. Isn't that interesting? All we want is peace. All we want is safety. From the government, give us peace and safety and get out of our way. This guy is going to come along and he's going to give the world in a time when they don't have peace and they don't have safety. He's going to bring it and it's all deceptive. It's amazing. Third point under this is that there is left behind a global economic, I'm not kidding you when I say, reset. You've, listen, we're already being conditioned about this word reset. Do you think, do you think Hillary Clinton invented this word? You know, remember what she did? We never even talked about the word reset until she met with Putin when she was Secretary of State. Does anybody remember this? Anybody, any other news junkies in here? And she took, she went to Staples you remember that little red button thing they have at Staples? For real. It's plastic. She puts it in her luggage. She takes it to meet with, with the Russians. And it's a famous clip. It's a famous video. And she extends the button. And she says, let's, let's have our nations start all over. Let's press the reset. Will you press it? And Putin's no dummy. It's like, are you kidding me? Okay. And he presses it, and nothing changes on their end. Reset. Listen, watch out when somebody mentions to you reset. Okay, because when God's mentioning a change to you, it's something like revival. Okay, it's something like resurrection. <laughs> it's something like redemption. But reset? Now listen, there's a global reset coming, according to the Bible. That wasn't Hillary Clinton's idea. And it's nobody else's idea right now because it's everywhere right now. We need a reset. Have you noticed? We need a reset. You're being conditioned. You need a reset. Reset. The word reset's popping up everywhere. You know why? Listen, the Bible tells us that there's going to be a global economic reset and that comes from the Bible, not from the newsmakers. The Bible says in Revelation 13, 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell. Imagine that. You can't use your ATM. You can't use, you, have no, you no longer have access to your bank account in an instant. No one can buy, and, buy or sell unless they have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Anybody know the number of his name? Say it again nice and loud. The Bible says the number of his name is 666. That there's going to come an event during the seven-year tribulation period of time, it's called, where something's going to happen and to create a global economic reset, people are going to be issued a prefix. Don't think for a moment. Don't think, oh, you know, this and we're all, it's, it's my social security number or it's my, no, it's not. Listen, it's a, the number 666 is a, is a prefix. Uh, so whatever your social security number is, he's going he's gonna to have you put, you have to accept his number. You're going to have to basically swear an oath or sign a contract. I'm going to abide by these rules. And that it will be a number now that's 666, 
One, two, three, four, two, nine. Are you with me? This is like your zip code, prefix. Imagine your, uh, just your numerical world, world. What if all of your pen numbers and all of your th things that you have, you have to have, a, you have, to have this 666 six, six in front of it. The Bible says that you will, not you, not you, the believer, but those living at that time, they will give their allegiance to him. Don't be, don't be tricked in thinking, oh my goodness, the vaccine's coming, and that's the mark of the beast. It's not the mark of the beast. It's conditioning you for it, okay? But it's not the mark of the beast. You're going to, listen, that generation of people will willfully say, I want the mark. Give me the mark. I want the mark. <laughs> They're going to want to be loyal to him. Think of it. But we're being conditioned. Who would have thought in less than a year we'd be conditioned to the, whatever we are today as a people? Who are we? Sit down. Stand up. Stay over there. This, you know, wash your hands. I'll put on the mask. Take off the mask. You still, plexiglass, this and that. Can't do it. Sorry, no surgery for you. It's not, you can't have this. And you can't, and, and we're like this. Right? Think of it. Think of it. And then a guy's going to come on the scene with an answer and his policies that promise peace and prosperity. You don't think people get in line for that? Oh, they're going to get in line for that. Remarkable. I want you to see this news this week out of Israel. This is remarkable. I encourage you, take a picture of it or go look it up. Read the whole article yourself. We won't force vaccine. But here's what we will do. This is, the, this is the Israeli government, Department of Health. This is Israel. Here's the deal. The article reads this. We're going to offer a vaccination in a matter of months to all Israelis in Israel. If you get the vaccine, you are now uh, labeled status green. Status green means you have all access passes to the entire nation and international travel in and out of Israel. Your status green. In other words, all things normal for you before COVID ever came. Next group. Status yellow. If you do not accept the vaccination, you can only visit from your home, which is itself a yellow zone, you can go out only to other yellow zones in the nation. And there's another color, and it's flat out, uh, I forget what it is, but it's not good. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about this now. This is actual reality. This is, this is national Israeli news. There's going to come a day when this Antichrist will issue a number to reset global economies. And most of us don't care about that because most of us just live in the here and now in America. We don't want anything to happen to our economy. We just want it to go back to last, month, last year. But listen, the rest of the world, they're hurting. A global reset. And then number two, we'll, we'll have to end next week. We're going to get into number two. And number two is fascinating. And that is, after the saints go marching in, there is left behind uh, a God in the making. <laughs> you, you notice how I spelled God there? Isn't it amazing that in, regarding the cults, everybody, regarding the cults, everybody gets to be God in the cults except Jesus. Have you noticed that? We have, we have friends that believe that if they're really faithful at what they've been called to do by their cult, that they will be gods someday. Where's the first time you ever heard a promise being made to a human that if you do what I say, you'll become a god? Satan said it. In the garden. It's, there's nothing new under the sun. We're going to learn next week. This guy comes on the scene. And he's going to declare himself to be God. We're going to read it. In 2 Thessalonians 2, if you read on, he's going to stand in the temple. 
Now, that's interesting. 2,000 years ago, you know, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. But the author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, tells us that in the last days of deception, this guy who's the pretend Christ, the imposter, he's going to stand in the temple. Well, there is no temple. But if you ask the Jews today, hey, what's going on over there? Well, we're getting ready to build the temple. Hello? Do you know they have all their priestly gear already made? Did you know that? They used to be searching for decades for the red heifer to sanctify the articles and implements. They already got it. All of this stuff, they're ready to go. You say, I don't believe it. You don't have to. <laughs> they do. You see? They're ready to go. Jesus said, when they rejected him, he says, me, you reject? Him, when he comes, you will receive. Here's a reference to the coming Antichrist. They rejected the real Christ, and they're going to accept an imposter. You want to know why? The Bible tells us again in the book of Daniel that he promises the Jewish state peace and prosperity. Because we're real suckers for that. I'm going to submit to you today, and we'll pick it up next week, that there's a spirit of deception in our world and it's almost like it's been given an elastic chain. Evil seems to be going everywhere. Lying, manipulation, intrigue. What is, for example, the belief system? What are we, as a nation, who are we? <laughs> when there's this part of the FBI and then there's this part of the FBI. And now we find out in the last two weeks there's this group of the CIA and then there's this group of the CIA. What? What's happening? Deception. You can, you, we can stand. We're all done, really. We can stand. <laughs> Listen to this. Have you ever been to a, a, a play? I tell you, if you ever get a chance, if you're not a person who likes plays, first of all, pick a good one and go to a good one, but I'll give you one to cut your teeth in on is, if you ever get a chance, you've got to see in person, and, and a good one, Les Miserables. Okay, Les, Les Miserables will blow your mind, especially if they obey, which they don't do it much on the West Coast, but I know they do in Europe because I, I first saw it in London. Les Miserables. Did you know Victor Hugo did that? Did you know, you don't know this, I bet, that Victor Hugo required that at the end of Les Miserables that all of the players come out on the stage and um, there's uh, Jean Valjean. You have the two guys. The Jean Valjean, you have the... Javert. Yeah? The two, those are the two big guys, right? The law... And the sinner. Victor Hugo did Les Miserables. It's a gospel presentation. And at the end of the presentation, Victor Hugo required that the gospel be declared from Luke's gospel chapter 2 at the end of every Les Miserables. In London, they did it. I saw it in London and they had, it was their, I think they said it was their 83rd or 88th year in proclaiming it. Something amazing. Lisa and I went to see it in L.A., of course, it's L.A. What they do? They left out the gospel. But Jean Valjean is a sinner. Javert is the law. All he cares about is the law. And that message is a message of grace and forgiveness. It's a powerful. In between the... The event, the, um, what do you call it? The, before you go to the next, thank you, scene, before you go to the next scene, everything goes black. And you see the screen drop, and the screen is black mesh. You can see just enough, but you can see people moving around, and everyone, you know, that you're looking. Because you see things moving, and it's like, oh, let's see what's next. Watch this. And then, 
the screen goes up and lights come on. It's a whole different scene, right? Somebody set the stage in between scenes. You could see them moving around, but you couldn't quite make it out until the lights came on. That's what's happening in the world right now. All of this global stuff. In fact, guys, can you put that quote on the screen from the Belgian prime minister? Paul Henry Spack, Belgian prime minister, said, former, he said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. This is the European Union. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold allegiance, right? Of all people. And to lift us out of the, interesting, huh? Economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. <laughs> Yikes. The stage is being set. That's why we're doing this series. I can tell you this right now. Um, in the next, um, I'll estimate on this. Let's push it out. In the next six to eight weeks, your life is going to change. Your life's going to change big. You say, what do you mean? Whoever's elected or whoever's reelected, your life is going to change. How do you know? I don't know anything. But I can see through the veil and I see things moving around on stage. Things are getting set up. Listen, for you to escape all this stuff that's coming when this system is void of Jesus is to give your heart to Christ. You're not, look, listen, <laughs> you can't give your heart to this church. We don't want you. I mean, we, I don't mean that. <laughs> I didn't mean that. We can't save you. We can't help you in that department but to point you to Jesus. He's the only one who can save you. Okay? You need to make that decision. Apart from Christ, you're riddled with sin. Isn't that amazing? You're, you live by your own thoughts. You do what you want to do. You look to see what's in it for you. We all know what that's like. We all lived like that before. Jesus wants to take control of your life, and he does it this way, by his Holy Spirit. And he begins first to manifest himself in your thinking. It's amazing. He said, oh, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you, you know what? You ought to open up your... I like saying this to people who are not Christians yet. You need to stop being so narrow-minded. <laughs> because the world is not you. It doesn't rise and set on you. There's a whole world outside of you. And Jesus said, when you find that out, you actually discover your own life. But if you live the way that you do like that, you don't, you don't find anything but death. Here's the amazing thing. You'll find out why you were made. What's your purpose? It would be terribly sad if I lived this life knowing what my purpose is and you didn't for yours when you could have. It's not your membership in a church. It's not the money you give or the things that you do. It's literally saying, Lord, if this is true, if all this is real, will you show yourself to me? And you're going to meet him in your thoughts. That's where he's going to first come knocking on your door. Because, you know, that's where everything takes place anyway up there. You're listening to you all the time, right here. And he's going to invade your thoughts, and you're going to know it. Because the, the, the syntax and the sentence structure and the words, you'll understand every one of them, but they will be a, it'll be a structure and words that you don't use. And he's going to say something like this. Hey, wake up. It's me. Why are you running? That's what he said to Paul, isn't it? Paul, why are you, why are you persecuting me? That had to freak Paul out. He could have said, I'm not persecuting you. I'm just killing Christians. <laughs> well, then you're persecuting me. That's a weird thought. 
unless Christ resides in the believers by the Holy Spirit. And then Paul's first words out of his mouth after that, what would you have me to do, Lord? And Paul believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to do the same. You need to decide to do that. He died for your sins. He rose again from the grave. I wish we had the time. We'd go to a 15-hour flight, go to Jerusalem, 45-minute drive up from Tel Aviv to the garden tomb, get you in line, let you look inside. It's empty. There's nothing there. Because he's risen from the dead. You need to trust him. Father... Father, I pray that anyone right now here together, anyone watching, anyone listening right now, whatever means, however this is broadcasted, whenever, that whoever now would stop and say, do I know Jesus Christ as Lord? Am I saved? If I died right now, would I go to heaven? Like 1 John 5.13 says that these things have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. God, search my heart. I want to know the truth. I don't want to be lied to anymore. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's honest enough to pray that prayer, that you'd reveal yourself to them. You did it to me, and you've done it to all those who are your kids. We thank you for who you are, and thank you for the hope that even today, we're hoping for a trumpet blast. We thank you, Jesus. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.